the Hakdama, the preface to the Chavetz Chaim's halachas on Hilchas Shabbos, on the laws of Shabbos. We, for those that were not present at the earlier time, and with your indulgence, I would like to recapitulate, I mean, do slightly what we've covered until this point, and then we can go from that point on. It says, the, the preface says like this, it is written in the Torah, you should remember the Sabbath to make it to make it holy for six days. You should work and on the seventh day you should rest. Because for six days God made the heavens and he teaches us this passage in the Bible teaches us that, that the subject matter of Shabbos is one of the foundation roots of the faith of Judaism. And we should know that the world was created. It didn't just always exist. And when, since God created everything, He is therefore the master of everything. And we are His servants. And we are obligated to do what He wants us to do, His will, and to serve Him with all our bodies, with all our souls, and with all our money. Because everything belongs to Him. And the Torah is admonishing us that we should observe the Shabbos in 12 different places. And our sages of blessed memory in the Talmud, anybody that watches the Shabbos is as though he fulfilled all the mitzvahs of the Torah. And anybody that, God forbid, though he, he denied the entire Torah. And the reason is, as we've mentioned above, because this is one of the roots of our faith. That a person that is considered a religious Jew is called the Shomer Shabbos. In truth, he's a Shomer Mitzvah. That's the really, he watches mitzvahs. But since Shomer Shabbos is such a, a tremendous, a big thing in the Jewish religion, we say that's a very wonderful thing. And this subject matter, you can see in the Medrash, Rabo, that the Chavetz Chaim continues to quote, in the Parshat from Bishab, the Rebbe Lezer ben Avino says, we find in the Torah and in the prophets and the writings that the mitzvah of observing the Shabbos is equal to all the other mitzvahs put together. In the Torah, it, it specifies, it gives a certain psukim, the thing that Moshe, uh, God said to uh, the time that Moses did not tell the Jewish people right away the commandment that they should observe the Shabbos. So God says, how long are you refusing to watch my commandments? Moses also was being criticized for being delaying and telling what God told him to tell. And my addict. And then it says, what there? See, the God has given you the Shabbos, and in the prophets it also says, you have rebelled against me, you house of Israel, in the wilderness. And why? Because you have observed, you have, you have profaned my Sabbath. And in the writings it says, on Mount Sinai I went down and I spoke, to you, spoke with them, and later on it says, I let them know of my holy Sabbath. God says to the Jewish people, if you will merit to watch my Shabbat, I will consider as though you watch all the mitzvahs of the Torah. And if God forbid you, you profane it, I will consider it as though you profane the entire, all the mitzvahs of the Torah. In other words, this is very important to God. And so he says, the person that watches the Shabbat from profaning it, and he keeps his head from doing anything that's bad and goes on to say further uh, how such a person is going to be blessed by God. And then he goes on to say, look how, how serious this sin of violating the Shabbos is. Because we know all kinds of, there are different types of punishment for different types of sins. There are some kind of sins that if a person transgresses, uh, like he violates a um, positive commandment in the Torah, and there are others that are even more stringent than that. And he says, you can, from the gradations, you can find out what is the most stringent of things. And he goes through a whole list of punishments until finally he says the, the most stringent of all punishments uh, for a capital punishment case is by death by stoning. And that is the death that is given to a person that violates the Sabbath publicly and repeatedly. And warned, and, and after and he's warned and everything like that. And if he's not put to death by a human tribunal, then the Gemara tells us that in fact God puts him to death. In other words, 
Nobody is going to go and violate this segment of Jewish religion without God punishing him very severely. And then he goes on to say like this. He says a concept that my father of blessed memory always said to me. He says, first of all, he says, you should know every part of our body needs some in order for it to be able to function. And my father, uh, here he spells out, he says like this, if with God's help, as it should be, all Jews will merit to go to heaven after they live this life, and if they are worthy enough, they merit to also be resurrected, and they will relive again. Even after they relive, God will unite, unite their souls with their bodies because they merit to live. You should know, he says, every organ of the body has certain things that nourish it, nourish the soul that makes that organ function. And if, God forbid, a person doesn't observe certain commandments, that appears later on when he's resurrected uh, for all eternity, something, a person doesn't do something well, he comes out with a crippled hand because perhaps he didn't put the spillin on his hand or some other reason that a person uh, comes is, uh, is revived but not a complete body without any blemish unless he repents before he dies. We're always talking about a case where a person persists in doing the wrong thing and never does the right thing before he dies. All right, that's how far we got before Mr. Samuels I wasn't here. I just wanted to re, uh, re, re, review it. Like we have, you were here last time, and we, we learned that. You know, almost the first page. Almost the first page. All right. Was, All right. Now I'm going to go. I'm going to start from from the fourth line on the bottom of the yeah. first page. Yeah, yeah. that's why I, I went there for that, just to uh, review it for you. And just like we say, the life of the world, the life of the, of the everlasting God is, has planted in us everlasting life. We have a potential to live for all eternity. When a person does an improper thing, he makes a blemish or he cripples that part of his soul of that mitzvah and therefore that that when it's resurrected cannot be resurrected uh, because it is lacking in nourishment from the spiritual uh, nourishment that is needed by that person doing the mitzvah while he was still alive the first time around. And how bitter that will be for such a person on this that everybody will know how great his, uh, his bitterness will be because he had not done certain mitzvahs when he had Philip. And just like this you can find, you can find to be a blemish type if he even is resurrected and any other of his organs. And as we learn in the Tark and Kohelis, on the Pusik, the end of the matter is, after we learn everything, Kohelis, uh, Shlema Melech, King Solomon discusses the attitudes of people that cast aside the, the problem, the values of Torah, and they want to do what they want to do regardless whether it is the will of God or not. As a result, God warns ahead of time and says, all those things you will do, they will not mean anything good for you. And as uh, King Solomon says, the end of the matter is, what is the entire person, what is good for a person? The Torah and the mitzvah, that's the entire person. If he engages in those, this makes it life worthwhile. Because everything will be known in the future for everybody that is resurrected that certain individuals have not lived up to what they should have been doing. So he comes out and says, you must fear the Lord, you must observe his commands. Turn the page, because this is the entire responsibility of a person. He wants to say that the 248 positive commandments and the 365 negative commandments which together make up the 613 commandments of the Torah. These are all necessary for various uh, parts of our body and our schedule. And uh, we should understand that if a person turns out to be, God forbid, blemished, 
and some kind of portion of his body or his sinews, it is because unfortunately he has not done what he should be doing in those areas in relation to mitzvahs that have that responsibility. So he says like this, uh, he makes a blemish in that soul of that particular, of, uh, how much shame and degradation such a person will bear because of this for all eternity. So he's admonishing us, you don't have to have all these bad things happen to you, you can do it now and you won't have to be suffering all eternity. So he says there are certain mitzvahs, for instance, that um, are very important for the well-being of our head and our heart, and other parts of the real organs of the body that uh, you couldn't live without them. And um, if we observe the Shabbos, which is a foundation of our faith, help us tremendously, and that he can live in this world. And because in this world, we should understand we're only living a more uh, animalistic type of existence. We're eating, sleeping, propagating, just like other lowly forms of animal. We're trying to understand that in addition to the animalistic type of, of a soul that we cater to in this world, we're also trying to go to come to a much higher form of a soul uh, that will be at the time of the resurrection of the dead. And for that, we have to get the nourishment, the spiritual nourishment, if you will, food. Uh, the spiritual food for that soul from the benefit that we earn by fulfilling the Torah and the mitzvahs. And he gives another concept. The merit, in addition to everything else, the merit of observing the Sabbath according to the way it should be observed, according to its Allah, will help a person that God will forgive him for all his sins, not only the sins in relation to Shabbos, but all across the board. The, the, the merits of, of observing the Shabbos according to a thing, as we say in the Gemara, anybody that observes the Shabbos, or even if he was a sinner like the generation of Enosh, when God flooded the one third of them to try to bring them to, to repent, and they didn't repent, God will forgive them. A few generations of Adam. Yeah. As happy is the man that does this. And the person that clings to observe the Shabbat from profaning it and watches him from doing any kind of evil. So he says, don't call it profaning it, but it says, Mokolo, God will forgive him. So we have this concept that God will forgive a person if indeed he observe the Shabbos according to its laws. Now, having knowing this thing now, we know first of all that the, we have discussed already that the observance of Shabbos is a foundation of our faith and the punishment for violating is of the very highest degree and the reward of the very highest degree. Having given this knowledge, we must now, the Kobus Chaim is going to tell us like this, it's not enough that uh, we admonish yourself that you should go and keep the Sabbath, oh, as he will, uh, we will learn inside. He will tell us, the mere fact that you get all kinds of speeches and pep talks about you've got to do the right thing and observe the Shabbos, not going to do the trick. The mere fact that you give your mooser admin admonition, you should do the right thing, because unless you know what to do, it's not going to do the trick. In anything in life, for instance, um, you want to play a game of ball. If you don't know the rules, you don't know how to catch, you don't know how to pitch, and you don't know how to hit the ball, you don't know how to field the ball, you would be a sorry sight there on the ball, a baseball court. You know? It would be a, a pathetic thing watching you try to do something that obviously you're not capable of doing. And the same thing, observing Shabbos, Requires knowledge. Now, knowledge just happens to drop into your lap. It does. You can't no, You can't go to a store and say, "I'm buying uh, ten dollars worth of knowledge," and walk out with it. Not at all. You have to acquire it. That means you have to study. That means nobody can do it for you either. And you have to study. But if you do study, you are then equipped. The 
possibility of observing the Shabbos. And as the Chofetz uh, Chaim was there, I don't know if we're finished with this, he will say this in, in his preface. You should know, it's not always, we don't always have ideal conditions to observe the Shabbos. A lot of times emergencies arise. When you have an emergency, you've got to know what is necessary to you, what you can do, and what you can't do, to meet that emergency in order not to violate a law of the Torah of all in relation to Shabbos. Now, if you don't know what to do to avoid it, it's inevitable that you will violate the Shabbos, not even in, intending to violate it. For instance, God forbid, a fire breaks out. You got no time to look at. You got to know what you're supposed to do right away, or something else of a serious nature that uh, it just happens right away. You don't have time for this. And that's why he thank you. Just getting admonition and working yourself up, pep talk and saying, oh, you should observe Shabbos, and uh, you agree to it, that's not going to do the trick. You actually have to become knowledgeable. <laughs> this, that will go further inside, I'll say it like this. And the reason that they say you have to observe the Shabbos according to its halacha, because it is known there are 39 principal types of activities that is prohibited to be done on the Sabbath. Now, what are the 39 principal types of activities? There is a Mishnah in the uh, Gemara Shabbos, right? all 39 principal types of activities. We will come and we will learn it inside in English, so you'll be able to understand each one of them. And these are what activities, almost every type of activity that is of a productive nature. In other words, you're not supposed to do productive work on the Sabbath. How do we know what works, which type of activity is prohibited to be done, and which is not? We learn from the building of the Mishkin, the tabernacle in the wilderness. The types of activity that were necessary to build that big tent where they used to offer service to God. What now? We had there are 39 principal types of activities not permitted to be done on the Sabbath. They are called Father works and then there are uh, children works in other words there are principal wives called pubbles and each type of oh father work there are many types of similar types of work that are also not permitted to be done and the Gemara Yerushalmi in the in Peric Cloud in the chapter called Cloud Godo and this is the great Pablo in Babylonian Talmud too that's where these laws are discussed it's one of the locus they learned out that they figured out and they found that each one of the 39 principal types of activities has 39 accessory parts of a thousand. In other words, you have 39 plus 39. 78. No, no, 39. Each one of the 39. Yeah. 39, uh, uh, 39. You have the accessories are not as important. But, but whatever it is, you uh, have to try to avoid it. And, and, a general rule is most uh, types of work that you would do that, that, that's constructive nature. You, 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 you are a builder. The thing that you build, or you're a rehabber. Yeah. And, we, and the Gemara gives us a hint that if you, you, if you observe the Shabbos like it's the law, that means that you should not violate it with any type of uh, this type of activity. And you have to come uh, to understand how to observe the Shabbos with all its particulars and, and have to look at it and be very careful to be diligent and that you should learn the laws of Shabbos and review them constantly in order that you know what is prohibited and what, that if you don't do this, even if you learn all the, all the subject matters of giving you admonition of, oh, you should be a good sh uh, Shomer Shabbos and everything, and we are trying to make you very diligent in that matter, to watch the Shabbos as it's fitting. It won't help you at all, because in truth, the mere fact you got a lot of desire to do so, you still can't do it, unless, as we learned in the Medrash and Mishle, uh, that you uh, have to vote both the wisdom as well as the, as the, as the booster. And if a person has wisdom, then he can learn booster. But if he does not have in his hand wisdom, he's not able to learn Musr because the Musr is, uh, is fruitless. 
He cannot do proper things. The intent is that if he makes a mistake in, in the subject matter, he would think that there's nothing wrong with what he's doing, and what will help him that he has a lot of admonition that you should observe the Shabbos when he doesn't even know that he's violating the Shabbos because of his ignorance. Ignorance is, is a very terrible thing to uh, possess. It's not a sin, but we're all born ignorant. Ignorance over the law excuses no one. That's right. And therefore, in this matter, if you think about a thing, that you, if you don't, if it's not in the classification of this type of prohibited work or something like it, it won't help him unless he knows what to avoid. Any even any admonition, for instance. I'll uh, give you an example. Say, yeah. and say for instance, it happens a sudden loss happens to a person. Because that's the way lo real life is. Yeah. You don't have time to look in a book and, yeah. uh, and think about it. Careful. It happens right away. That that his, his behemoth, he's got a, a cow or something, it runs away on chops. And somebody didn't tie it down good or whatever it was, and it's running away. Yeah. Now, if he doesn't get it, it's going to be lost to him. Yeah. And it's, that's a valuable... Uh, big time, it's a big thing. Yeah, a big thing. Yeah. Or he has, uh, he has uh, uh, geese or chickens and they bought and they're not accustomed to stay in his house. And they're running away. So what is he supposed to do? That's a question. What is he supposed to do? He can very easily make a mistake and stop on an Easter because... 39 principal types of activity prohibited to be done on the Sabbath is trapping. You're not supposed to trap an animal. In other words, on Shabbos. On Shabbos. And that's a Torah law. It's not a law of the rabbis. It's a Torah law. You're not permitted to trap an animal on Shabbos. You want to trap it or anything. Well, you can't so, catch a fly in a cup or something? You're not permitted. Please don't play games. Uh, we're talking about now, you have a cow, it's a valuable... A fly is very valuable. You Black. just grab it. Black. If you just grab this spider, you might be trapping, you might be coming under the easter of, of grabbing it. And also, if you tell to a goy to grab it for you, that is also uh, not a proper thing to do. So, if you know how to do it in a way that you won't lose the animal, and yet you haven't officially trapped it according to the Torah law, you can get best of both ways. You can save your yourself from the loss of the animal. At the same time, you haven't violated the Torah law. Now, what are you supposed to do? Wait, he's telling you here. He's telling you this. And you say you can say like this. You're not supposed to say to the boy to save the animal. He says you can holler out. Anybody that saves save these things will not lose. Will not lose. In other words, you're not supposed to tell to save it for you, but you can shout out, anybody save this, uh, this animal, not lose. In other words, you can't make an agreement for him to do it, but that is a, a, uh, a reward. generality, you're not I'm making any agreement. Or you can say to the boy that he should go and let those, those birds, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, geese or chickens, Put him into a place that is not considered trapping according to the Torah law. How is that? If you put it in a big house, word, it's not easy to grab them. For instance, for instance, you have no, you have nothing. You put them in a, and you still haven't really caught them yet, but they can't run away out someplace where you can't catch them, like in a big. A roof over the over a big, a big, a big, big like a barn, a big or, barn, or could it be a big barn? Trapping it actually, you grab, but it can run around in the big barn. There's no round. There's no way around for you to do it. What are you going to do? Yeah. This man makes a lot of livelihood. His horse runs away, and he uses his horse to ride his wagon. He can do that. No, he can do it. He can close. He can close it if it's a big area. It's not considered. There's a fence with a. a a big area is not considered a the type of a trapping that's prohibited in the Torah law. In other words, you got to know this ahead of time. Yeah. These outs. If you don't know ahead of time, you've got no time to look in the in the 
Wait, I'm gonna look at it. Is that gonna work? <laughs> what if the animal's oh, trying to stop? No, but this is, he's trying to give you a, an example that you should understand in the real world, you've got to know what you're doing. You can't just guess at it. There's no way in which you can guess it. No, you say you will not lose. If, yeah. I, if, if, if there's nobody around. You don't lose, that means you're going to gain. There's no one around. Huh? You, can't, you can't promise what... That if somebody came to him with a chick and he saw something wrong with the chicken and he know that these people need the chicken to live. They're poor people yeah. and they need the chicken to eat. Even if it was a little bit wrong with the chicken, he would tell them they could use it because he knows that those people got to have more lenient than others. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes if there's an emergency situation, yeah. but you can figure out a way of avoiding that loss in many cases. If the, if the man is a rich man, he figures he can go buy another chicken. Yeah, what now? Another, another example. All right, he says like this, now. Or he puts it in a big house that it's not easy to grab him, even after it entered, it entered to it, so therefore it's not considered Sego, the Arise. It's not considered, uh, considered a trapping of a Torah law. You understand? Yeah. All right, fine. And also another example of the Gomorrah, it happens, say for instance, it happens yeah. that a flame, all of a sudden, the tablecloth is bursting in flame on Shabbat. Yeah. And the person is, is frightened. He's frightened and he loses money. You know, because because <laughs> the first thing he would, the first reaction would be to try to put it out. You understand? That was yeah, his first right, reaction. Right. Even though he knows it's prohibited. Yeah. That that's his first reaction. So let's do it. And this all is because he doesn't know what way he can go. He, doesn't he would know there is a way of accomplishing this fact that the fire should be extinguished. How is that? He can pour water all over the area that's not yet burning. Oh. That's perfectly all right. Because it's going to reach to that area eventually. Yeah. And that is all right. That is not the extinction of fire. You understand? And, and uh, you just have to know ahead of time how to avoid. Now, this is a wonderful thing to understand. So you can have all the things that you benefit from what you need. At the same time, you don't have to buy it where you pour the water. Yeah. Yeah. The fire will get to that point. And then yeah, have, yeah. There's nothing that's impossible to be done. It's just that you don't have to know how to do it. A person that doesn't know how to go and repair a thing, yeah. it's, a, it's a pathetic thing to watch him. Yeah. Everything he does, he do, doesn't use the proper materials. Yeah, he doesn't put it the game, yeah. uh, together. If you watch him, it's a pathetic thing. He doesn't know what he's doing, and he's going to have it done all over again because it will never stand up the way he's doing it. You've seen that. I'm sure you've seen that. No, I got the times. You don't have Sunday trivia. The trivia. I, I think you should. They got an auction page. Did you, see? you? You never look at that. I don't. What is it? An auction page. 75th and South Shore Drive. You're going to have it. Shane of Clock, it's in South Shore Drive. On South Shore Drive. On South it's Shore Drive, it's, it's getting bad. Because okay. Okay. Now, in All the right. case of a fire, because there is a question of, you can call a good to put it out. Whereas the other thing, about. you understand, not to save the thing. In case of what? Of, of a fire. fire. Of the color. You understand? Oh, boy. What do you get about? Oh, okay. You pick up oh, the oh, oh, hey. There's a fire here. Yeah. But but you can go do that in, in our neighborhood. Go. That is, um, I give you permission to call. Hey. All right, now give us another right. example. Paying the Easter uh, borer. There's another prohibition in this. In this. You're not supposed to select things. Select things. It's a, it's a prohibition of uh, paying the Easter borer. Also, in the, in there you have a, 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 a dash. Paying the Easter borer. Prohibition against. Look where I'm pointing. I see the dash. The moment? Yeah, no, you're right there. I also, well, we'll, we'll just yeah. a few more minutes and then we'll call it a, a shear. Wow. Uh, and prohibition against the choosing, it's very uh, often happens to stumble on such a thing because he doesn't understand what to do. Say, for instance, he has two pieces of meat and two types of poultry, and, they, and uh, if he selects one other than the other, he wants to choose one rather than the other, and there is a possibility he may be violating the Torah law of selection. So what should he do? If he goes and what does he do? He should just take what he wants to eat now and leave the rest. 
In other words, he's not selecting, he's just eating a portion of it. That's okay. Why? What's wrong with selecting? Selecting? You're not supposed to put order. You have a selection of things. Even on the Kiddush table, on, on Shabbos, you have a selection of different things. You, you choose. Yeah, but you just take a piece of it. You got this is an example that you got a big pot, and you got in the pot both chicken and meat. So you want to know when you, you you have a taste for chicken or you have a taste for meat. So you dip in your spoon or and whatever fork, comes out, and you pull out. No, you're picking out the piece of meat out of the pot, or you're picking out the, the chicken out of the pot. So he's saying that you can do if you're only going to eat one piece of meat or one piece of chicken. Just because you, you take it. We call it that.